In a moment, we'll be looking at a scripture that pertains to a case of conversion to Jesus Christ. The account of this conversion is found in Acts chapter 16. And it covers not only the matter of the conversion of the Philippian jailer, but it also preceding it tells us about Lydia, a seller of purple, a businesswoman who was converted, verses 14 and 15. And it tells us about Paul's encounter with a young woman who had a spirit of divination, and that caused him a great amount of sorrow, and so he cast out the demon. And to make a long story a little bit shorter, those who had been using her brought him before the magistrates of the city, and it ended up with him, Silas, being beaten, cast into prison, feet fast in the stocks. And they were in a sorry state, to say the least, all because they loved the souls of men because they wanted to declare the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. What I would have us do now is look to chapter 16 of Acts, and we'll begin reading in verse 19. And her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. I might pause here and say that should be fresher in our minds to view the events of the last day or so in Alaska. It's just what an earthquake can do. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Uh, but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now what I would like for us to do regarding this passage of Scripture is just to see a number of points that we can glean from it because we live in a world that will go to this passage and say, see, all you have to do to be saved is to believe, because that's what the inspired apostle told him. And at that point, you are saved from your sins, and it's Jesus that does the saving. Well, is that the case? I think most here would know it's not the case. But it's important to learn more about the text though we may be quite familiar with it. Number one, we learn that there must be no fellowship with error. That's clear. Acts 16, 16 through 18. 
You can see from this passage that the Apostle Paul would not allow himself to be identified with the maid of divination. She, he would not allow himself to be identified at her false teaching and what she was involved. Wouldn't permit that at all. Wouldn't tolerate it. We should be the same. The Word of God makes this clear in all sorts of passages. At this point, I think of 2 John, verses 9 through 11. Whosoever goeth onward, as the American Standard has it, and abideth not in the teaching of Christ, hath not God. 1 John 4, 1 tells us also, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, approve them, whether they be of God. That's our job. If you talk about things that Christians do to be faithful, that heaven can be their home, here's one of those things. We don't just believe any and every teacher that trots down the road. Use your Bible to test what others teach, which demands then that we must study our Bibles for ourselves. In fact, I would say test everything, even in this sermon. There must be no fellowship, that is, no approval a false doctrine in any form or fashion by God's people. And the Bible is clear on that point, even as it is clear here. But we also learn that what may appear to be a defeat can be turned into a great victory. Paul and Silas had been thrown into jail. And that, I'd say, looks for their perspective, pretty gloomy. And they're not feeling too good either. They've had, as we might say in our Texas parlance, the stuffings beat out of them. And that's just about the way they are. Now, most of us who are so strong in this day and age to face persecution and hurt, you know, we have our safe places to go nowadays. Then I don't know what we would have done and what we would really do if we had to undergo this to preach what I'm preaching right now. But he preached it, and he didn't mind going through it, and he went through it because he loved the lost like God loves the lost. But as I said, what appears to be defeat can be turned into victory. And this allowed them in this given situation to convert the Philippian jailer and his household. Now when we pray that people be open-minded, that they hunger and thirst after righteousness, that they be looking for God. Do you realize what they may mean in God's providence as to how we reach them and what we must go through to find them? It's not just all on their part. Yes, I'd love to see more and more and more people hungering and thirsting after righteousness. But then on our part, we may have to crawl through a very small place full of snakes and spiders to be able to spoon feed them. But there, you see, sometimes we're thinking, they've got to do this. Well, what do we do to get the gospel to them? Well, what did Paul and Silas do to get the gospel to this man? We also learn that men who are somewhat, maybe a great deal, indifferent to divine things, to spiritual matters, to the Bible, may suddenly be touched by the good news of the gospel. Apparently, this man had not been involved in giving much attention to the singing or the praying, if he heard it at all, of Paul and Silas. Others did hear it. Prisoners did. There are people around about us today, and more and more of them, who pay no attention to what we do. They may know we're a, quote, church people, unquote, whatever that means in their mind. I'm not sure what that means. But it's not for them. But notice, sometimes things happen that get people's attention. In this, quake, in this case, it was a great earthquake. I wonder if anybody thought anything at all about death, dying, and God in Alaska a couple of days ago. 
So this man's heart was touched. He was caused to think about things in ways he had never thought about them before. Have you ever realized as you look back over your life that things happened in your life to cause you to focus on certain matters that if they hadn't happened, you might not have done so? Sometimes we have all sorts of things around us saying, here's the way to go, and the more they point us down the right way, the more we fight against it. So he became willing to be concerned about what they were preaching. Are we in a position in our lives daily, so if we come across someone like this, are we prepared to teach them? We also learn how to react to adversity. I don't think this day and age in the church, in America in particular, we know how to act toward adversity. Any little thing uh, just upsets us to no end, and we're willing to throw up our hands and walk off and, you know, try to find the Frady hole and get in it, all this kind of thing. Back up in Arkansas where I'm from, and it would be true of North Texas and all across Oklahoma, because there's so many tornadoes, then lots of folks have what we used to call them when I grew up, because most of them that dug by shovels by people called storm cellars. And there'll always be somebody in a little community around there so scared of thor storms that the old saying would go about said every time a cloud comes up, she runs to the cellar. Well, that's the way a whole lot of folks are today in America. The first little thing that goes a little bit out of, out of sorts, well, they just all fall to pieces and they're on the floor kicking. You ever seen these fainting goats? in Tennessee, basically where they came from. You startle them and they just fall over stiff-legged. You think they're dying. That describes my brethren to a certain extent. First little thing that happens, boom, in the floor they are. Well, I hope it doesn't hit everybody because somebody's got to help somebody up. There are many times in the lives of every one of us, some more severe than others, I'm sure. In fact, I know. We're involved in very strenuous suffering. However, we have the good word of God. And the Bible teaches us that if we'll trust in what the Bible teaches, put your trust in God based on what he said, take him at his word, God will help us and give us strength. And you say, well, preacher, tell us exactly how he does it. Well, you're going to be waiting a long time to get it out of me because I'll just have to say, he does it, but I don't know why he does it. But he's promised in his word that he would do it. And when you read all through the Old Testament at the unfolding of the great scheme of redemption through many, 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 many years and all sorts of characters involved in it, and it all came to pass, then I think he can get us from earth to heaven if we'll just do what he tells us and take him at his word. It's not necessarily the case that God will get us well. It is not necessarily the case that our problems will soon be over. Whatever the various uh, factors are, the problem will be one that must be faced with strength and courage. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I believe that. I don't ask me how it can be done, but it means if I take him at his word and I live according to that word under any and all circumstances, it all comes out right in the end. Because you're not going to go to heaven in this fleshly body on this earth. You've got to leave this earth <laughs> to go to heaven. And you can leave it early, or you can leave it late, but leave it you will. Now, it seems to me that a whole lot of the part of us being Christians is to cause us to be mindful of that fact. You know, when you look at the Bible sometimes on its discussion of death, it doesn't pull any punches about death. It talks about it rather openly, very plainly. You read about every one of the patriarchs and you read about the genealogy and at the end of it he says and he died, scattered to his fathers. That's just the way it is. Face it, it's coming. When? I don't know. What does that mean? Get ready. So we need to be strengthened. I can do all things through him that strengthens me. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. 
Trust in Jehovah or the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Now look at the end of this. And he will direct thy paths. Now will he or won't he? Well, he will. To what person? The person that trusts in God with all of his heart. What does that mean? His whole inward man, his intellect, his rational powers, his emotions, his conscience, all that he is. He trusts in God as God reveals himself in his word. He doesn't try to second guess him. He doesn't try to excuse himself and think that God will still be happy with me when I'm violating what I know the Bible says. He doesn't try to say, seek ye first and then say, well, he really means seek ye third. He doesn't do that. But for the one that follows what he says here, he shall direct his path. The problem is that we like for him to direct our paths when we're going where we want to go. And that won't work. So that makes clear that we're to trust in and acknowledge God, knowing that he will then direct our paths. We're to trust God not ourselves. Well, how do you do that? Well, when self wants to go wandering around contrary to where God says go, self says don't go that way. Go where God wants you to go. Yeah, but it hurts to go where God wants you to go. What did he say? Well, what is faithful service to God since faith comes by hearing the word of God? Romans 10, 17. It's letting him direct ourselves. I've got to trust in somebody. Now, do you trust yourself or do you trust God? If you trust God, you trust his word. Yeah, but it leads me where it hurts sometimes. Well, David said he leads me in pathways of righteousness for his namesake. Do you think that Jesus was led in a very comfortable situation to save your soul from hell? What did we remember when we remembered him in the Lord's Supper? And in the songs that we sing, the pain and the anguish, just think for a minute. We think about Gethsemane. We think about the events leading up to the cross and the actual cross. But think about the great creator who created this world flawless. Watch men mess it all up through sinning and then decided to come into this world himself and live a sinless life in a world that was his and that he made and man had messed it all up. And he had suffered for it. Why didn't he just say, I'll just do away with them and start all over again? But he didn't. Because your soul just and my soul were so much, so much more than any one of us even begins to realize. I was thinking during the Lord's Supper a moment ago, why? What is there about me that would cause him to do these things. Well, I can only hope that in getting to heaven, I'll, I'll grasp and understand that. But I want to get to heaven. And that means taking him at his word. We're to acknowledge him in all our ways, in all our relationships, in all our states. When we're well, when we're not so well, when we're sick, when we're very sick. When we're poor, when we're prosperous, everything in between, the result will be that God will direct our paths in this life that leads to glory in heaven. So here is a great lesson from Paul and Silas in this account of conversion of this jailer. Here they are in the inner prison. They're beat all because they love the souls of men. They're hurting. Their feet are fast to the stocks. Yet they know who controls all things, and they know why they're there, and they know that Jesus suffered for their life. It may also be noted that they were singing and they were praising, praying. They were directing their prayers to the right people, or to the right person, I shouldn't say people, to the right person, to God himself. People noted that. I wonder what those heathens really thought. Who? What's going on here? This is so different from what we're used to. I again say it would do you good 
to study about the mindset of the great, great, great majority of the people and the culture of that time. They had no concept of things like this. So this was just registering on them as a complete, completely contrary to everything they understood. And yet there they are. What confidence and what trust and what love of God and love of lost souls is manifest in Paul and Silas and rejoicing in the sufferings, all for the cause of Christ. Is there anything we can learn in the Lord's church today as Christians from this simple, long-time studied case of conversion? We also learn that Christians are to take advantage of what we might call wayside opportunities to teach the gospel. Sometimes we may make great plans about big things but pay little attention to opportunities to teach here, to teach there along the way. And yet here is an opportunity, and there is an opportunity to teach. And Paul and Silas did it. So they took advantage of it because they were looking for those opportunities. You know, a lot of times you've got, and you've got them all around right now, these uh, criminals who are just looking for opportunities. They didn't go out today saying, I'm going to steal your car. But if the opportunity avails itself and being the thief and thinking like a thief, they think they can get away with it, then uh, there it is. I'm going to take advantage of it. Well, what about that when it comes to the church and the Great Commission and thinking of the souls of men? You may not have had this person and under those circumstances in your mind, but it avails itself. Now, what do we do about it? Do we try to open the door further? Do we try to say the appropriate thing to cause the person to think about their life? So they take advantage of it, as that is, Paul and Silas, as we all, every one of us, to do. Then there's in teaching, one must start with the pupil, the student, where that person is. The jailer was not yet a believer in Jesus Christ. He's a heathen. He's a pagan. He's typical of most of the Gentiles. On the day of Pentecost, we find the apostle Peter and the other apostles presenting to the Jews the evidence which should prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. They went through Jewish prophecies and showed how they fit the Lord Jesus. You look at the Ethiopian eunuch. The Bible teaches us how that Philip the Evangelist began from the passage of Scripture that is Isaiah 53. We studied about not long ago. He took him where he found him in his knowledge and led him further. He preached unto him Jesus. Saul of Tarsus was a man who believed in God. Saul realized that if he is to be saved, then he must be obedient to God. Now, when our Lord appeared to him, Paul believed on him. And so, when Ananias, the gospel preacher of the Lord, selected to go to this believer, who is a penitent believer, he told him what to do to be saved. You're a candidate for baptism. What are you waiting on? As a believer who's repented, now you can be baptized to wash away your sins. So he asked, what are you waiting on? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins. So there's the way you take different people where you find them. Do you ever, quote, fish with people, unquote, just to find out what they know and what they don't know, so you'll know maybe what to say? Well, if we like to go fishing, have you ever considered when you fish, how you'd try this brush top, maybe by this pole, or you uh, would uh, maybe try a different lure or a different bait. All of it's designed to catch fish. No wonder Jesus said to real fishermen, come after me and I'll make you fishers of men. A lot involves some thought on our part, doesn't it? Because do you think of yourself as a fisher of men? Then, too, you notice the essentiality of faith must be uh, zeroed in on. One cannot be saved without faith. Nobody's ever that knew the gospel ever taught such a thing as that. And again, faith is formed by the knowledge you get from the Word of God, Romans 10 17. Hebrews 11 and 6 makes it clear that without faith it is impossible to please God. 
Now, he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice, diligently seek him. I don't know where you may be, but there's got to be in you develop the desire to seek him. If you can't get that desire in a person, you're not going to be able to reach him with the gospel. There must be the desire in a person to seek Jesus. You can't be saved from your sins without having faith in God. Nor can you be saved without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the Jews, Except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. Moving from that, we learn also the lesson that we must preach all the word, not part of it, but all of it, that is needful to that specific person where we find it. If a person needs to learn about faith in God, we need to start there. We must teach him about all the Bible has to say on that that's necessary for him to understand what the Bible says on it. If he needs to have faith that the Bible is the Word of God, then we need to know how to teach that. And so on you can go regarding repentance and confession and the church, its organization, work and worship, and so on. We must take them where we find them and bring them on. We must be sure that they hear the right message. They must hear the gospel. Not merely some message about Christ, but what the New Testament calls the gospel message. You know, we have a common attitude in our nation that just as long as you're sincere and have a good feeling toward God and the Bible and Christ, everything is all right. You really don't have to be right about everything pertaining to serving God. It'll be okay. God knows you're a human being and you make mistakes. Members of the church fall for that. They know they're to be faithful in the church. Discharging obligations only members of the church can discharge. But they will tend to fall to, for the same thing that people do who want to obey the gospel. They'll justify themselves in not being active. Even though they know the Bible says, be ready into every good work. Well, what good works? Well, all things pertaining to living faithful Christian life. Bible study, teaching others, worshiping God correctly, setting a godly life, being a godly man, a godly husband, a godly father, woman, wife, mother, children. All that the Bible teaches, then you're putting that into practice. But we sometimes say, well, I'm doing part of it. So hopefully that part will outweigh the part I'm not doing. God's going to be happy with that because he's a merciful, gracious God. But that's not what the Bible says. But we convince ourselves that it is. One doesn't have to know the truth, according to some people. I noticed a little deal the other day where a very liberal religious person who would call herself a Christian had a discussion with an atheist, and they ended up that she found out she agreed with him. Because she was so loose. That's what you call practical atheism. And there's some of my brethren who give lip service to God, Christ, the gospel, the Bible, the church. They're really practical atheists because they don't practice it. And if you don't practice it, what's the difference in you and the atheist who denies it and won't do it? So it's important that we hear the right message. We need to know the truth. We need to know those of us who are teaching what that message is and to teach it. And another point that needs to be made, it must be seen that the gospel includes obligation. I don't, I've already touched on this, but we don't like obligations. Now think for a minute. When you know you're obligated to do something, especially, especially if there's a certain time it has to be good, Let's see. What's the best illustration? Taxes on April 15th. It has to be done. Oh, but you can file an extension. But there's an end to the extension. There's always an end to it. You can, you can extend things, some things, but there's obligations. That, that means they must be done. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get 
members of the church themselves and say, you know, I, I'm sorry, this, I'll just have to let this go. This is the will of God that must be done. But you don't see that. What really you see is, I must do this, this, that, that, the other, and God takes the leftovers. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And we know it as far as knowing the Word. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Oh, but you see, that was said to those outside the church. You know, that was said to Jews who were already in covenant relationship with God. But that's the way we, we use that because it certainly applies to those who are not Christians. But it applies to us who are Christians also. And then you, when you look, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, notice what? He that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now the question I must say, when I was baptized into Christ, I was raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ. Now what, what's the significance of that? I don't live like I used to. I don't think like I used to. God's kingdom comes first. Does it? We, we quote Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And as I've said countless places and many times I've preached on that, our problem with that verse is not our lack of ability to understand it. It is our unwillingness to abide by it. It's that simple. No amount of glossing it over. It just comes down to that. If you look at the judgment parables, you see people standing up saying, Lord, did we not do many mighty things in thy name? And did we not do many mighty works? What's the Lord going to say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Which tells me there are people who say he's Lord, he's the Savior, and I think I'm serving him. Well, what did the Lord tell them? When it was too late, you're not. Well, how can I know I am? Whatsoever you do, if you look around, you might see that somewhere. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. It's always that way. Now, that's, see, now we're back to the beginning of it. Let Him direct you. Well, how does God direct me? I'm a free moral agent. I have to will His will to be done. And we have the perfect example of that, of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't want to die. If there's any other way I can get out of this misery and horror, let me out. But the resignation, not my will, thine be done. And that must be the attitude of every Christian, and it will be for those who go to heaven. There won't be any effort to try to get out from under the obligations God says to one in order to become a Christian. And the same is true once you're a child of God. You'll be zealous of good works as the Bible defines those works. You'll do those things even when they hurt. Because it's right. And it's right because God set it out in His Word. And it's the way to heaven. The way, how many times have we sung this? The way of the cross leads home. It's not the way of the fellowship hall and all the fun and games. And I want to stop as we end the lesson and remind all of us that a lot of folks are involved in religious organizations for the fun, the frolic, and the fellowship. They're not there to bear crosses. They're not there to develop into the likeness of Christ. They're not there to preach the word in the whole counsel of God. They're not there to contend for the faith. They're not there to bear the burdens of their brethren and to help each other to walk the straight and narrow way of truth. They're not there to go into the inner prison having been beaten and their feet and fast in the stocks and still be able to sing praises to God and pray to Him until we develop that disposition of sacrifice and determination to do what is right as the Bible defines the right. We can never be what we ought to be and God expects us to be. And 
We must be if heaven is to be our home. Now, God may not call on us to suffer like Paul and Silas or anybody else, but the attitude ought to be there. If doing right causes me to suffer, I will do right and I will suffer, whatever it is. That's the attitude. It's always the attitude, brethren. Go back to Cain. His whole attitude was to have it my way and follow all the way down to this present time. And too many people, I'm afraid the great majority, if God's will gets between them and their will, guess one, guess which one gets set aside. There is the rub. There's the problem we all face. But we cannot allow our wills, our desires, our loves with this present world or whatever to cause us to disobey the Almighty who loved us enough to give His precious Son to undergo all that He did to save us from our sins. We've studied for a while what to do to be saved. We see faith alone won't save you, but faith plus repentance, confession of faith, and baptism for the remission of sins will save you from your past sins and make you a Christian. And you're a new creature in Christ. You see what faith then is required of those in Christ to discharge their obligations to their Lord who has purchased them with His precious blood. If you need to obey the gospel, we plead with you and beg you to do so. If as a faithful child of God, if that's your case, wonderful. Just take lessons like this and make yourself stronger and more determined and more steadfast. But if as a child of God you sin, then repent of them and turn from them, praying God for forgiveness, having confessed them. And we ask you now to do that if you need while we stand and sing.